through the jungle, and the sun would flash off his beautiful coat of fur. And he just knew that all the animals were so in love with his beautiful coat that while they were admiring him, he could very easily sneak up and get them. Well, he, there was no animal in the forest that the tiger feared except the water buffalo. Tiger wasn't afraid of anybody, but the water buffalo was so big. And because he was big, he could move fast for his size. And he had these horns that, oh, you never want to get caught up in that. And so he was that, the water buffalo was the only animal that he was afraid of. So one day, Tiger was walking past the fields and he saw water buffalo tied to uh, something that looked like a plow. And there was this some kind of creature walking behind the plow at telling water buffalo what to do. And Tiger didn't recognize the creature. He'd never seen anything like it before. And he thought, why is water buffalo at the command of that little creature? Well, one day, Tiger saw water buffalo behind a string of wires. And so Tiger went over to water buffalo and says, water buffalo, why are you standing behind those wires? All you have to do is push your horns and you could tear the whole thing down. Why are you standing back there being captive? Well, what a buffalo say. And he says, and what is that little thing of a creature that's pushing you and that tells you what to do? What is that? And uh, so what a buffalo said, it was man. And so well, Tiger couldn't understand this. He just could not understand this. He says, so what power does he have over you? And, and the water buffalo said, he has wisdom. And Tiger thought, wisdom? Oh, I need some of that. <laughs> I bet if I had some wisdom that I could control all the animals in the forest, I must find a way to get me some wisdom. So uh, Tiger says, OK, water buffalo, how, how do you think I can get man to give me some wisdom? And so um, Tiger began to look around. And, and one day, he saw man in the fields and he was protecting his goats. And so Tiger hid behind a tree. And when the man came by, Tiger jumped out from behind the tree and he says, he growled and man was shaking in his boots. The sight of Tiger could scare anybody. So man was shaking his boots. And Tiger said, oh, Mr. Man, I, I, if you will tell me how I can get some of this wisdom, I will let you live. And man, he was so afraid. He said, I tell you how to get some wisdom. So... Man says, well, the first thing you have to do, I have plenty of wisdom back at my house, but I have to go and get it. And so Tiger said, oh, that's fine. Go and take your time and, and hurry up. Take your time and hurry up back here with that wisdom. <laughs> and so, uh, so man says, well, I have to do something first. He says, I have, you have to let me tie you to this tree, tie your paws to this tree. And Tiger says, oh, OK, OK, go ahead here, tie me to the tree. And so, uh, and then man said, you have to let me tie your feet to the tree. Tiger said, now this seems odd, but hey, since I'm going to have wisdom and I'm going to be able to control things, OK, go ahead, go ahead. And then man said, um, you have to let me tie your head to the tree. Tiger says, now this seems kind of strange, but look, hurry up already, because I want this wisdom. So man tied Tiger's head to the tree. 
And so Tiger was all bound to the tree. And then he decided, and man went home to get the wisdom. But he took his goats with him and locked them safely behind the fence. Well, it looks like it was taking man quite a while to get back. And Tiger was saying, where is that man? He's been gone for hours, it seemed. Where is he with my wisdom? The animals came by. They looked at Tiger tied to that tree, and they thought, you look a pickle tied to that tree, Mr. Tiger. But Mr. Tiger knew that he was waiting on his wisdom. So the man never did come back. Now the whole day was gone. All the animals had passed by, and they had seen Tiger tied to that tree, and they laughed at him, but nobody would help him get a loose. So Tiger decided that if I'm going to get out of this fix, I've got to do it myself. So Tiger began to wiggle and twist and wiggle and do everything, and finally, almost night, he finally got a loose from that rope that had him tied. So Tiger was hungry by now. He's worked up an appetite, so he went down to the river to get him some water because he was pretty thirsty. So he went down to the river and looked in the river, and he thought, what is this? What are these stripes on me? Oh, my goodness. It must be from that rope. Well, Tiger finally figured out how to get wisdom. But from now on, every other tiger in the world was born with black stripes on that beautiful golden coat. So my advice to you if you are prepared to pursue wisdom, you must be prepared for its consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Josie. That was great, wasn't it? Right, right. Give her another hand, Josie. Now, our next teller is from Charlotte, and I first, uh, I think I first saw her at uh, Stone Soup in South Carolina. Uh, a lot of charm, a lot of wit, great puns, full of energy, educator, storyteller, Lona Bartlett. My husband and I were expecting our first child. I was so excited about becoming a mom. And so I got out a piece of paper and a pen, and I wrote down all of the old and poems and stories and songs that my parents shared with me when I was little. And when our first child was born, our little girl, I sang to her the very first song on that list. Rock a baby on the treetop. Wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall, and down will come baby, cradle and all. My daughter cried. <laughs> no, and why shouldn't she? I mean, after all, I had just threatened to put my child in a cradle, take her to the top of the tree, leave her there, and let the wind knock her down, plummeting her to the ground, probably to her death. I cried too. 
Uh, no, baby, no, honey, no, sweetheart, no. No, mama's not going to do that. No, I'm going to protect you from everything. Really, mama's going to be there. So I got out that piece of paper and a pencil, and I crossed that rock -bye baby thing off the list. I can't sing that to my child. I mean, I'm supposed to be protecting them. And a couple of years later, our son was born. <laughs> my little buddy, oh my gosh. He was an early walker. So on the first warm rain, I took my children outside. We kicked off our socks and our shoes, and oh, we had a glorious time running about and splashing in the mud puddles. It was wonderful. And I thought about that list, and I sang another song from it. It's raining, it's pouring, the old man is snoring. He went to bed and he bumped his head and he couldn't get up in the morning. Head trauma. <laughs> I'm singing to my children about head trauma. I, 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 I can't sing a song like this to them. I mean, that man couldn't get up because he was either dead or in a coma got out that piece of paper and I scratched that one off too. What is a mother to do? And then about a year and a half later, our youngest daughter was born. <laughs> we nicknamed her Goose because that's exactly what she was. She was just a silly goose. And I thought this time, this time a rhyme, I will share with my children a rhyme. 369, the goose drank wine, monkey chewed tobacco on the streetcar line. Line broke, monkey got choked, and they all went to heaven in a little rowboat. <laughs> wine? Chewing tobacco? My daughter wasn't even two years old yet. And that monkey, he hung himself. And where did that rowboat come from anyway? And who'd want to be buried in one? I had to scratch that off the list, too. You know, my kids were going to be relegated to... I, I, I didn't know any songs, it seemed, that didn't end in death and destruction. My children were going to be left with that, that little Scottish girl, you know, the one who went this way and that way and this way and that way? She was obviously very confused and, and, and directionally challenged. Or how about that spider? You know, the one that goes up the drain and down again and up the spout and down again expecting a different outcome. Now, is that not the very definition of insanity? <sighs> My children were going to have a very limited early childhood experience with music and rhyme. Well, my dad got sick. And I was a homeschooling mom. So I was able to kind of have some flexible time. I packed up my kids, I packed up some books, and my kids and I got on an airplane from Charlotte and went back up to upstate New York to the old farm. When I got there, I realized that my father was very close to the end of his life's journey. Oh, he had some bad days. But then he also had some really good days, too. And on those good days, he sang and told every one of those old poems, stories, and songs to my children, including one of my childhood favorites, the Dunderbeck machine. In the town where I was born, there was this fat old Dutchman 
His name was Dunderbeck. He was awful fond of sausage meat and sauerkraut and speck, and he had the finest butcher shop that ever had been seen, and he ground up all that sausage meat in Dunderbeck's machine. Oh, Dunderbeck, oh, Dunderbeck, how could you be so mean to ever have invented the sausage meat machine? Now all the cats and dogs and rats will never more be seen, for they'll all be ground to sausage meat in Dunderbeck's machine. Go with me here. This is a memory I am sharing with you. <laughs> Don't leave me hanging. One day when I was walking, I went into that store and I ordered up some sausage meat and eggs a half a score and as I stood there waiting, I whistled up a tune and all that sausage meat got up and danced around the room. Oh, Dunderbeck, oh, Dunderbeck, how could you be so mean to ever have invented the sausage meat machine? Now all the cats and dogs and rats will never more be seen for they'll all be ground to sausage meat in Dunderbeck's machine. Stay with me. <laughs> One night, that machine, it wasn't working. That old thing, it would not go. So old Dunderbeck, he climbs inside the reason for to know. Yes, we're going there. Like I said, just stay with me. His wife, she had a nightmare, came walking in her sleep. She gave the crank an awful yank and Dunderbeck was meat. Oh, Dunderbeck, oh, Dunderbeck, how could you be so mean to ever have invented the sausage meat machine? Now all the cats and dogs and rats will never more be seen, for they'll all be ground to sausage meat in Dunderbeck's machine. When my dad was finished, I looked at my children and I saw the wonder and the delight in their eyes. I looked at my dad and I looked at his eyes, his crystal, crystal blue eyes. And I realized at that moment that my father was using all of those old poems, songs, and stories to teach my children about the full and the complete cycle of life. <laughs> my dad left, and so did my kids and I. We, pick, we came back down to the Carolinas and I uh, pulled out that piece of paper. And this time, I used the eraser. And I erased all of those marks and scratches that I had made across all of those old poems and stories and songs, every single one of them except for that rockabye baby thing. That is a terrible song to sing to a newborn. <laughs> so I changed the words. Rockabye baby, safe in my arms. I'll do my best to keep you from harm. But when you fall down, I'll dry all your tears, and whenever you need me, you know, like when you get up in the middle of the night and you're sick, or you go to school and you flunk a test, you get your heart broken, <laughs> you go off to college and you get homesick or you have your first child and they cry and they cry and they cry, 
oh, honey, just call me and I will be near. Thank you, Lana. Lana Bartlett from Charlotte. Now, our, our next teller is, is also from Atlanta and also is artist, artist in residence at the Wren's Nest, uh, the Joel Chandler How, How Harris House. And she's a colorful person and she can do drama, she can do poetry, she can sing, and she goes by the name of Miss Love Drop sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to love her. Here she comes, Gwendolyn Napier. Hello, everyone. I want to say before I get started, I have developed so many mounting storytelling families since I have been here. And so tonight, my stories will connect to family. It's gonna be really uh, a fable and also like a folk tale. So just bear with me, okay? This is my song to Amanda and to Ruth and to all of my mountain storytelling families. It's story time in the mountains. It's story time, yes it is. It's story time in the mountains. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We'll celebrate in ten wonderful years. Come on, clap. It's storytelling time in the mountains. It's storytelling time. Yes, it is. It's storytelling time in the mountain. We'll celebrate in. We'll celebrate in. We'll celebrate in, we'll celebrate in ten wonderful years. Yeah. May I remove this mic, please? Okay. I see. Well, we can make it work like this. Are you coming to help me? Okay, thank you. Give him a round of applause, okay? Thank you so much. This is gonna be, as I mentioned, an African tale, it could be fables. In the mountains, you create and you find so many wonderful families. And so my mind went back to family connection and this story, you might have heard this story, it is called Don't Mess With Miss Nana's Children. Don't Mess With Miss Nana's Children. Now, Miss Nana was a very, very small, petite, beautiful lady. And Miss Nana had a husband. His name was Mr. Nana. And they lived on the continent of Africa. Now, Miss Nana and her husband had really built a nice little village on the very edge of the area where they lived. Now, Miss Nana could go any place she wanted to go because when she left home, the birds and the squirrels and the rabbits and the fox, all of the animals would look out for who? Miss Nana's children. See, Miss Nana could go any place. No matter where she went, she knew that her children were always going to be safe. So Miss Nana decided, I'm going to go today in the back of a hut, and I'm going to do some gardening. Now, I'm going to leave all of you here in the front because I know nothing is going to happen to none of you because all of the animals are here. The birds were flying all around. The rabbits were hopping. The fox was trotting. Everybody saw Miss Nana go to the back. But before she left, she said, animals, 
children. Nothing is going to happen today. But animals, I want all of you to look out for my children. Make sure nobody comes into this village and take my children away. She went to the back, was taking care of her business, and the children just played, having fun, skipping and in the dirt. They had a one of a time. And the birds in the tree was just saying, tweet, 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 looking down, making sure they were safe. Now across the water lived a huge, huge elephant. Now the elephant never crossed over when Miss Nana was in the village working in her house. But this day he decided, I'm going to cross over and I'm going to see Miss Nana. That was a very bad decision. Well, the elephant crossed over and he was walking and looking and walking and looking. And he looked in the front and he saw all of Miss Nana's beautiful children just laughing and just playing and having a wonderful time. And he said, where is Miss Nana? And they said, she's in the back doing some, some gardening. And she'll be back. She's not too far away. Now the birds looked down at the children and said, Elephant, you need to go back across the water because nobody messes with Miss who? Nana's children. Do you think the elephant listened? Oh, no. Oh, no. He said, uh, I'm not afraid of Miss Nana. Now even the rabbit came down hopping. Mr. Elephant, if I were you, I would go back across the water. Because see, nobody messes with who? Miss Nana's children. And then by that time, here comes the frog. Uh, Mr. Elephant, I don't know what you're doing, but the bird tried to tell you. Now the rabbit tried to tell you. Now I'm trying to tell you, go back where you live because nobody messes with who? Miss Nana's children. Well, the elephant said, I'm not afraid once again of Miss Nana. The elephant reached down and he sucked up Miss Nana's children in his trunk and they went safely down into his belly. And he took them back across the water where he lived. Oh my goodness, what a big mistake. He went strutting with pride because he knew he was nice and huge and he took them back across the water where he lived. Well, Miss Nana, she came from the back. Children, where are you? Children, but nobody answered. Birds, birds, where are my children? Rabbits, where are my children? Fox, where are my children? Frog, where are my children? The bird said, Miss Nana, now you did not hear this from me, <laughs> but the elephant took your children back across the water. She said, oh, no, no, no. You must mean somebody else's children, not mine. And then here comes the little rabbit, Miss, Miss Nana. You didn't hear this from me either, but that Huge elephant. He did. He took your children back across the water. And then a poor little frog, he came in and said, you didn't hear me either, but the elephant did. Take your children back across the water. Miss Nana, she straightened up. She got her back right. She didn't start stomping. She didn't start fussing. She went inside her little hut area, and she put on her little apron. Mm -hmm. You know how ladies do, right? And in the apron pockets, she put in there some black pepper, some salt, some hot pepper, and a little small incision knife. And Miss Nana went straight. Miss Nana went straight, and she crossed over where the elephant lived. And when she saw the elephant, she looked at him face to face and she said, uh, I'm Miss Nana. Now, I was told that you took my children and they're over here across the water. The elephant said, that's true. I have them. You Miss Nana? She said, yeah. 
I came to get my children. He said, now, Miss no, no. I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to give you a chance to go back across the water where you live before you go to the same place where your children are. Miss Nana said, you must not know who, who you're talking to. I'm small in stature, but I can really make up a fuss. The elephant kept on talking mess to Miss Nana. But Miss Nana kept looking him eye to eye, not backing down. The elephant got his trunk and he, he souped up Miss Nana. She went right down into the big belly where the children were. And not only Miss Nana's family, but other people who live in the village were down there too. And the children were crying. Oh, mama, mama, you finally found us. And she saw the other neighbors, everybody was sitting around in the elephant's belly. Mama, we're hungry. We need something to eat. The elephant got us before you came back to give us our lunch. Miss Nana start thinking, no problem. Miss Nana realized in her apron she had salt, she had pepper, hot sauce, and a small, small little knife. Miss Nana got that knife out, and she started to call back, call out, and shave elephant meat inside of his belly. She started carving that elephant meat, and she got a, a nice little round little area down in, in the elephant's belly, and she put that meat in the center. She got out the salt and the pepper, and she get out the hot sauce, and she rubbed two sticks together. And Miss Nana started the fire right inside of the elephant's belly. Oh, my goodness. Oh, they was cooking up some good elephant meat, and she fed the children, and she fed the neighbors, and they said, Miss Nana, give us some more. She shaved it out some more. And she put it right there on the fire. And by that time, that elephant was up moving and strutting and falling. And his trunk was blowing smoke. And he went down on the ground. And he was lying right there on his side. Oh, what's wrong with me? I'm hot. I'm feeling sick. Now, Miss Nana took that same little knife that she shaved the elephant meat on the inside. And she made a small little incision in the belly of that elephant. And she told the children, I want all of you to climb out one by one. They all climbed out, and so did the neighbors. Miss Nana, she came out last. She was strutting. She told them, now all of y'all go back. Go back across the water where we live. And then she dealt with that elephant. She got down on the ground. She got eye to eye to that elephant. She said, elephant, the bird tried to tell you. Mm -hmm. The frog tried to tell you. Mm -hmm. The rabbit tried to tell you. Now, I'm going to tell you, don't nobody mess with Miss Nana's children. Well, Miss Nana, she got herself together. She went back across the water. To this very day, the elephant never, ever, Cross back over where I miss not not live because he realized it was true. Nobody messes with Miss Nana's children. Now that is my story. You can believe it or not. Thank you. Peace and love from Atlanta. Nobody should mess with Miss Lovedrop. <laughs> what a story. I never heard that story before. Give her, give her a hand. That was a great story. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this next teller, I know this fella. Uh, he's, from, he's from North Carolina, but he lives in Ocala, Florida. And he's uh, active in the Florida Storytelling Association. Uh, and we work together on the festival that we have in Florida. And, and he's... He's a great story. It's heart. If you heard him last night at the Ghost Stories, that was pretty good. Wasn't it? Andy Russell, storyteller and plays the guitar.
A few years back, I was sitting down for a songwriting session with a buddy of mine who has a toddler at home. And when I asked about his little boy, my friend just shook his head. He's about to drive me crazy. Well, it turned out that his little boy was going through that phase where he asked what felt like 100 questions a day. And no matter how thorough your answer was, the kid already had his follow-up question prepared. Why? Why? And that made me think of a five-year-old boy named Johnny. Now, to meet Johnny, we need to go back to the mid-1990s when I was living in the tiny little town of Rogers, Ohio. Rogers is located near both the Pennsylvania and West Virginia state lines, but it's far enough out that no one's going to be delivering a pizza to your house. <laughs> Rogers has one stoplight, one gas station, one grocery store, and one restaurant. But they had two churches, Rogers Presbyterian and Rogers Methodist. But the Presbyterian church had closed and had boards on all the windows, so everybody who was going pretty much went to the Methodist church. Rogers Methodist was your typical white wooden country church with a steeple on one end with entry doors at the bottom and a bell up top that they rang on Sunday mornings. Now at the time, they did not have a piano or an organ. They didn't have anything against them, they just didn't happen to have one. So I began to use my guitar in services on occasion. So when they were looking for someone to lead the music at Vacation Bible School, I was pretty much elected by default. <laughs> now, if you are familiar with Vacation Bible School, you will recognize this schedule. The kids are in classes according to age in the first part of the morning. This is followed by the all-important snack, and then all the kids joined me in the sanctuary to work on the music part. Now the idea was we'd work on the music a little bit each day. And on Friday morning, the kids would put on a concert for the parents. And the other big event we had planned for Friday morning was an interactive version of the story of Jesus calming the storm. Well, it's the first day of music. Uh, the kids are filing into the sanctuary. I'm up front double checking that I have everything. And I'm also keeping an eye out for Johnny. Johnny was a new kid who had joined our kindergarten class. And the pastor had asked a couple of us to keep an eye out for him. In the end, I heard Johnny before I saw him. I hear this little Whap, 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 whap. That turned out to be the sound of little red tennis shoes flying down the main aisle of the church toward me. And I looked up just in time to see this kid take his last two steps and launch himself airborne in my direction. I had a moment. A moment where I'm trying to save my guitar and my neck and at least break the fall for this little kid. In the end, all three of us were just fine. The kid made a perfect landing, wrapped his little arms and legs around my left leg, and just hung there, <laughs> kind of like a tree frog. <laughs> and everybody clapped. And I looked down into these big brown eyes and this head full of curly hair, and I said, hello, Johnny. And he just grinned right back up at me, and he said, guitar man. <laughs> well. We made Johnny's flying leap into a ritual that week. That's the way we started music every day. <laughs> and now that I had my guitar out of the way and I was expecting it, I actually looked forward to it. The kid was amazingly light, but he had this air of fearlessness about him that seemed bigger than he was. Johnny's story was a sad but not unusual one. His dad was in state prison on some drug-related charge. His mom had just begun rehab in Youngstown, Ohio, so Johnny had come to live with his Aunt Patsy in Rogers for at least the summer and possibly longer. Now, at the end of each day, the pastor held a short debriefing. What's working, what's not, what's on tap for tomorrow. That week, every meeting had at least one Johnny story. My personal favorite was the day that 
Johnny bit a little girl in his class. It was on the arm and he did not break the skin, but when they, when they asked him why he was mad at the little girl, he said he wasn't mad at her. He just wanted to know what she tasted like. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right, it's Friday morning. The music part came off without any major glitches. And we start in on the, on the story of Jesus calming the water. Now for this, Walter Ledbetter had loaned a John boat, this big flat bottom fishing boat. And they brought it right into the sanctuary, had it up front in front of the, the very first pew. And the whole thing is up on cement blocks. And they had these two poles coming out the back where one of the, one of the adults could use to literally rock the boat and simulate rough waters. They tried it with one of the teen volunteers the first night, and he dumped half the disciples into the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> so we made that an adult task. And we had two, uh, two teen volunteers reading from a script that had built-in cues for all the other kids. So when the reader said, and the wind blew, well, all the kids would wave their arms and make wind noises. And when the reader said, and the lightning flashed, some of the bigger kids in the back would turn all the lights in the sanctuary off and on and off and on and off and on. And when the reader said, and the thunder rolled, well, that was my kids. I had all the little kids, and, and including Johnny, and we, we, we had this, this big piece of sheet metal hanging there. And when they gave us our cue, all my kids commenced to banging on it with these padded drum mallets we got out of the preschool class. It was glorious. The only real job I had was getting them to stop banging on it after, after a little bit. Well, it's Friday morning, the story is going great. Everybody is into it. Outside, real live thunderstorm. That just added to the drama. <laughs> now when the reader said, and the wind blew, well, the rain was, the wind was pounding the rain against the windows of the church. And when the reader said, and the lightning flashed, real streaks of lightning were, were mixing with the, with the, the flickering lights. And when the reader said, and the thunder, boom, this big clap of thunder shook the entire church and knocked out all the lights. <laughs> Chaos all over the church. Kids were screaming. Teachers were calling out to classes. Parents were calling out to kids. <sighs> well, they got the lights back on pretty quickly and things calmed down. One blessing, in the middle of all that commotion, I did not have to worry about where Johnny was. As soon as that clap of thunder hit, he wrapped himself right around my leg again. But this was not like a tree frog. No, this was, this was more like a frightened beer cup high in a tree. The pastor invited everyone out to the kitchen for cookies and punch. And as they filed out, I just kind of stood there with Johnny locked around my leg. And when they were out, I... I got him up on the pew beside me, and I said, that was kind of scary, huh? And Johnny nodded. For once, that air of fearlessness was just gone. He seemed smaller somehow. And I thought about trying to finish the story of Jesus in the storm just so he'd know everything came out all right. And I thought about trying to connect what he was feeling with the fear the disciples must have felt. But in the end, what I said was, do you need a hug? Johnny didn't say anything, but he scooted over and pressed hard up against me. And I put my arm around him, and we sat just that way, just that way, until it was time to go home. After that, I mostly saw Johnny on Sunday mornings. Uh, but he and his Aunt Patsy came out to the, the farm a couple of times. He loved to chase the guineas and play with the baby goats. But then one Sunday, I came in, and Johnny was just gone. Uh, Patsy said he was back in Youngstown with his mother. And not long after that, I took a job in South Florida and moved away from Rogers. The last update I had was 
that Johnny had graduated from high school and had joined the Army. So I'm in that songwriting session thinking about my buddy's little boy and all these questions. But mostly I'm thinking about Johnny and all the questions he, he must have had and all of the whys that, that no one could answer. And in the end, in the end I realized that without Johnny, I could never have written this song. My boy said, Dad, I've got some questions. I'm so glad that you are here. His little face was worried. I could almost see a tear. Why do people say goodbye? Take sunshine and some rain If we want the joy in the lives we live We must also take the pain If you don't know the ache of a broken heart You can't know when love is real I know it's hard to understand But that's the deal I've got some questions, I'm so glad that you are here. Why does my birthday last one day when I've waited one whole year? Why are some people hungry when there's food in the grocery store? Why are there storms and floods? Why do also take the pain if you don't know the ache of a broken heart you can't know when love is real i know it's hard to understand but that's the deal love the people around you take the time to hold them close maybe the people the ones that need love most learn to listen from deep inside when you don't know what to do and know that no matter what happens your daddy still loves you now my boy is a grown man and he shipped off to Iraq the only prayer I can say anymore is, Dear Lord, bring him back. Lord, I've got some questions. I'm so glad that you are here. Thank you. Thank you, Andy Russell. Andy Russell from Florida. Great story. Great stories. They're all good stories. 
Now, our next teller is unique in many ways, and one of the remarkable things about her is that she has been to every one of these festivals <laughs> since they started. All those, and, and she's gathered stories from around the world, from the Orient to, to Europe and back to the United States, and is known for her Native American stories. And, and that's just another treat for you. It's Casey Terrell. <laughs> I'm afraid you're going to have a bit of a workout with this story. <laughs> I would like to tell you a story from the magnificent Icelandic saga known as the Prosetta. It told of life in the Viking Age all over, and it told a lot about villages and towns and hamlets and how every one of them had a wise man and or a wise woman. And this is one such tale, which oddly enough, kind of walks with stuff we're dealing with now. You see, there were these two men. There was Angatir, a tall, kind of gruff man. And there was Atar, a shorter, stout man who was usually a little jolly. But they weren't very jolly right now. We open on a scene. Two groups of people bundled up in furs because it's February, it's Norway, and there's a full moon. And they're yelling at each other. Angatar and his family and friends, and Atar and his family and friends. And they're angry about a piece of land. A little beautiful piece of bottom land that they both claimed. And at one point, Angatir had spread very indiscriminately poison all over. And it got into the little river that ran near this piece of land. And of course, what do rivers do? They carry everything downstream. And some of Atar's family and other families downstream, some of the kids had gotten sick. And animals had died, including wildlife. Well, Atar wasn't having that. He stormed over to Angatir's house with a dead rabbit he'd found and threw it on the door and said, Look what you did! No more poison on my land! Ha! said Angatir. That's my land and I'll do what I like. Two years this had been going on and brought us to this cold, snowy night. Now, it wasn't actually snowing, but it's Norway. It's February. There's snow on the ground. Well, everyone was there. One side, no poison, no poison. And the other side, my land, my land, I'll do what I like. And boy, they were fighting and hollering at each other. Fists were being shook, and it looked real close to maybe violence. And suddenly, the people in the front who were arguing noticed that it was getting very quiet behind them. And the quiet spread through the crowd until even Angatir and Atar noticed something was going on. And they looked around and watched the crowd part as she, who speaks for spirit, came walking toward them. She walked right through the crowd, walked right up to Angatir and Atar and passed them, then turned around so she was facing them and stood there looking. And everyone was like, blah, 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 him, him, her, her, this one, this one, that one, that one. Silence! And boy, it got quiet. She looked at Angatir and Atar and pointed down, and they knelt in front of her. And she put a hand on each shoulder. Justice, she said. Justice, said the crowd. Spirit says that the one who can name the most owners of this property shall have control of it now. Justice has spoken. And with that, she walked straight out back to the village, and everybody knowing what this meant 
quietly went home. But that was just the start. The next month, because they had one month to figure this out, for the next month, Angatir and Atar were all over town talking to the oldest members, talking to their oldest relatives, consulting records that they could find, anything they could look up to figure out how many owners had had that piece of land. Angatir's followers and supporters were sure he could figure it out. He's got the best memory. He knows the most people. He'll be able to win. Oh, no, said Atar's friends. Oh, sorry, I'm blocking you. <laughs> no, no, said Atar's friends. He loves the land best. He take care of it best. Pff, said others. It doesn't matter who loves it best. Who owns the land the longest? Well, in this fashion, all the Saturdays and Sundays, the Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, Thursdays rolled away and gone. And we were back to a Friday night under a full moon. But it was March now, so it was not so much snow. Well, everyone went down to a little shed that was in one corner of this field. And there, she who speaks for spirit had a little fire going, and she was sitting beside it. The whole town turned out, not just the people that supported the two antagonists. Everybody was there. And they sat quietly or stood quietly waiting. Sure enough, here came Angatir and Atar. And they got there, and everyone could tell everyone was a little nervous, except she who spoke for spirit. She looked at Angatir and said, Go, tell us what you know. Angatir stood up, <coughs> cleared his throat very importantly, and started naming father, son, father, son, father, son, father, son, father, son. Seven generations. <gasps> Seven generations? Heavenly days. Everyone was amazed. That's a long time ago. Angatir bragged about, yes, I asked my oldest relatives, I asked my elders in, in our clan, and, and that's what I found. Seven generations. Oh, yay, Angatir, yay, everyone that was supporting him said. So he sat down. She who speaks for spirit looked at Atar and said, now, Atar, you may tell us your tale. <clears throat> Atar was a slightly humbler man. He stood up, <clears throat> cleared his throat, and began to name the owners of the land. There is the fungus and the mushroom, the insect and the herb, the worm and the grass, the spider and the flower, the bee and the mouse, the mole and the minnow, the turtle, the frog, the snake. There's the tree and the squirrel, the rabbit, the fox, and the hawk. These are the true owners of the land. They've owned it since before we ever showed up, and they'll probably be here when we're gone. That night, Justice decided that Atar owned the land, or at least had stewardship for as long as he could control it. And no more poison went downstream to anybody else's family. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kans Mr. Kent. Casey. It's a great story. Weren't these great stories, all these stories? Did they have a good time? 
<laughs> you know, the, the mark of a good festival is that you go away with a smile on your face, warmth in your heart, and a thought or two in your head. I got all three this week, from this past two days. And let's hear it for our tellers again. And, and for our interpreter, who has been telling stories all day. <laughs> That's great. Now, before we take a break, I think there was a special announcement. No, serious. Ser yeah, here you go. Um, this is the commercial, don't change the channel. <laughs> I'm Leslie Shelley, and I love this festival. I've had a wonderful time, and I hope you all have too. Yes. Yes. The amazing thing about this festival and any festival is, number one, the magic it brings to all of us and the community that we live with, but the amazing people that put it together. We have been given the wonderful opportunity in July of 2025 to host the National Storytelling Network Conference in Georgia. Yeah. I'm involved with the Georgia Storytelling Network. Our president is Gwen, who you heard earlier. Yeah. And we're just putting a shout out. If you might like to be involved with the planning, the telling, the organizing, any, any way at all with this National Storytelling Network conference, we have got forms in the back on the Georgia Storytelling Network table. All we need is your name and a way to contact you. So many people say, I could never tell a story. Can you unload a car or go to Costco and buy snacks? <laughs> There's something for everybody. We would love to have your help. And if you have a chance between now and the next set of tellers, drop by the table back there. And uh, it would just be great to see you there and to have your assistance. Thank you. And I want to think we should thank the audience for being here and listening and, and, and giving us your full attention. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Uh, we're going to take a break, and it's just the last, the last, we're going to home stretch. The LDO is coming up, so you don't want to miss that right after, right after our break. Thank you all for being here.